it's very helpful for people to hear that they should make themselves competent and dangerous and take their proper place in the world. Competent and dangerous? Mm -hmm. Why dangerous? Because it's the alternative to being weak. And weak is not good. The people who shoot up the high schools, they're weak. They're weak. How is it good to be dangerous? Because it makes you formidable. And life is a very difficult process. And it's not for, you're not prepared for it unless, unless you have the capacity for, to be dangerous. That doesn't mean that you should be cruel. It doesn't mean any of that. There's a statement in the New Testament, the meek shall inherit the earth. But the meek isn't well translated. It means something more like, those who, those who have swords and know how to use them but keep them sheathed will inherit the world. That's a way better way of thinking about it. You have to be powerful and formidable and then peaceful in that order, right? And that's not the same as being naive and weak and harmless, which is what young men are being encouraged to be. It's like, that's a very bad idea. It's a very bad idea because naive, weak and harmless means that you can't withstand the tragedies of life. You can't bear any responsibility. You'll end up bitter. And when you get bitter, then you get dangerous. But one thing I'm not getting, there's a big difference between letting people do something for themselves and saying men should be dangerous. By dangerous, that implies I should be ready to threaten someone, to hurt somebody. No, you should be capable of it. But that doesn't mean you should use it. There's nothing to you otherwise. Like if you're not a formidable force, there's, not, there's no morality in your self-control. If you're incapable of violence, not being violent isn't a virtue. People who teach martial arts know this full well, right? If you learn a martial art, you learn to be dangerous, but simultaneously you learn to control it. Both of those come together. And the combination of that capacity for danger and the capacity for control is what brings about the virtue. Otherwise, you confuse weakness with, with moral virtue. I'm harmless, therefore I'm good. It's like, no, that isn't how it works. That isn't how it works at all. If you're harmless, you're just weak. And if you're weak, you're not going to be good. You can't be, because it takes strength to be good. It's very difficult to be good. And your critics, your female critics say, you men are already stronger than we. You abuse us and you're encouraging that. Oh, well, that's definitely not the case. I mean, I've had tens of thousands of people write me now and say that, you know, they've taken my message to heart. They were nihilistic or addicted or aimless or having trouble in their relationships or not moving forward with their partners, their wives or girlfriends. And they've been trying to develop a vision for their life and to take responsibility and to quit using deceit and they're better for it. And there's no downside to that for anyone, men and women alike. And most of the reason that men have been coming to my lectures is I think part of that's just an arbitrary baseline fluke. Almost all the people who watch YouTube are men. It's like 80%, 75, 80%, it's about the same for me. So it might be that my message is particularly attractive to young men, or it might just be that, you know, I was particularly popular on YouTube and that's mostly a male domain. Yeah, it's popular with young men because you're saying, yeah, go ahead, abuse women. <laughs> no, I've never said anything like that. And I think that that's... that's it's okay to absolutely. hate trans people. No, it's not okay particularly to hate anyone, maybe even your enemies. And, I, and my, what I've talked about has virtually nothing to do in any real technical sense with trans people. The stance I took on Bill C-16 was an anti-compelled speech stance. And I, I stand by, by it. Government. Absolutely. There has never been a piece of legislation in the history of the English common law that compelled private speech. Not once. There has been legislation that compelled commercial speech. So, for example, if you sell tobacco, you have to put a warning on the product. But that's commercial speech. It's very, very limited. And even that's been extraordinarily limited. The Supreme Court in the U.S. in the 1940s came out and stated forthrightly that there was to be no compelled speech uh, generated by the, legis by the legislative and the executive branches that that was unconstitutional and it violates English common law tradition and the fact that it has to do with transgender people is virtually irrelevant. The issue is compelled speech and if it wasn't the issue this would have died away, all the scandals surrounding this would have died away 18 months ago. It's not what it's about. It's about the government and the ideologues that are pushing this sort of legislation attempting to uh, exercise uh, tyrannical control over voluntary speech. And that's a no-go zone as far as I'm concerned. So somebody wants to be called Z or Zer, why not? I don't care what people want to be called, that's fine, but that doesn't mean I should be compelled by law to call them that. The government has absolutely no business whatsoever, ever, 
governing the content of your voluntary speech. Like, I don't even like hate speech laws. I think they're a big mistake. And that says what you can't say, right? This is what you have to say. That's a whole different, that's a whole different ballgame. So ball you were game. personally willing to accommodate people if they want to be called something odd? We could have a conversation about that. And if I was convinced that you knew why you were asking that was actually in your best interest, that, and you weren't just attempting to exercise ideological control over me for reasons that had absolutely nothing to do with you personally, then I might consider it in my private conversation, just like I would if you asked me to use a nickname, for example. So, but there's a big difference between privately negotiated modes of address and legislatively demanded compelled speech. It really has nothing to do with transgender people or except peripherally the transgender issue.